Hello there and welcome back. Nick here. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for uh, being a subscriber if you are. And we are uh, reading The Hatchets by Gary Paulson, a dramatic reading here. And we are picking up on chapter five. We're going to hear how Brian does on his uh, second night, I believe, trapped out in the wilderness. Chapter five. His eyes snapped open, hammered open, and there were these things about himself that he knew instantly. He was unbelievably, viciously thirsty. His mouth was dry and tasted foul and sticky. His lips were cracked and felt as if they were bleeding. And if he did not drink some water soon, he felt that he would wither up and die. Lots of water. All the water he could find. He knew the thirst and felt the burn on his face. It was mid-afternoon and the sun had come over him and cooked him while he slept. And his face was on fire, would blister, would peel. Which did not help the thirst, made it much worse. He stood, using the tree to pull himself up because there was still some pain and much stiffness, and looked down at the lake. It was water. But he did not know if he could drink it. Nobody had ever told him if you could or could not drink lakes. There was also the thought of the pilot. Down in the blue, with the plane, strapped in, the body. Awful, he thought. But the lake was blue and wet-looking, and his mouth and throat raged with the thirst, and he did not know where there might be another form of water he could drink. Besides, he had probably swallowed a ton of it while he was swimming out of the plane and getting to shore. In the movies, they always showed the hero finding a clear spring with pure, sweet water to drink. But in the movies, they didn't have plane wrecks and swollen foreheads and aching bodies and thirst that tore at the hero until he couldn't think. Brian took small steps down to the bank of the lake. Along the edge there were thick grasses, and the water looked a little murky, and there were small things swimming in the water, small bugs. But there was a log extending out over about twenty feet out into the lake, into the water of the lake, a beaver drop from some time before, with old limbs sticking up almost like handles. He balanced on the log, holding himself up with the limbs, and teetered out past the weeds and murky water. When he was out where the water was clear and he could see no bugs swimming, he kneeled on the log to drink. A sip, he thought, still worrying about the lake water. I'll just take a sip. But when he brought a cupped hand to his mouth and felt the cold lake water trickle past his cracked lips and over his tongue, he could not stop. He had never, not even on long bike trips in the hot summer, been this thirsty. It was as if the water were more than water, as if the water had become all of life, and he could not stop. He stooped and put his mouth to the lake and drank and drank, pulling it deep and swallowing great gulps of it. He drank until his stomach was swollen, until he nearly fell off the log with it. Then he rose and stagger-tripped his way back to the bank where he was immediately sick and threw up most of the water. But his thirst was gone, and the water seemed to reduce the pain in his head as well, although the sunburn still cooked his face. So, he almost jumped with the word, spoken aloud. It seemed so out of place, the sound. He tried it again. So, so, so here I am. And there it is, he thought. For the first time since the crash, his mind started to work. His brain triggered, and he began thinking. Here I am. Where is that? Where am I? He pulled himself once more up the bank to the tall tree without branches and sat again with his back against the rough bark. It was hot now, but the sun was high and to his rear, and he sat in the shade of the tree in relative comfort. There were things to sort out. Here I am, and that is nowhere. With his mind opened and thoughts happening, it all tried to come in with a rush. All of what had occurred, and he could not take it. The whole thing turned into a confused jumble that made no sense. He fought it down and tried to take one thing at a time. He had been flying north to visit his father for a couple of months, in the summer, and the pilot had had a heart attack and had died and the plane had crashed somewhere in the Canadian North Woods, but he did not know how far they had flown, or in what direction, or where he was. Slow down, he thought, 
slow down more. My name is Brian Robeson, and I am 13 years old, and I am alone in the north woods of Canada. All right, he thought, that's simple enough. I was flying to visit my father, and the plane crashed and sank in a lake. There, keep it that way, short thoughts. I do not know where I am, which doesn't mean much. More to the point, they don't know where I am. They, meaning anybody who might be wanting to look for me, the searchers. They would look for him, look for the plane. His father and mother would be frantic. They would tear the world apart to find him. Wouldn't you as a parent, those of you who are parents? I certainly would. Brian had seen the searches on the news, seen movies about lost planes. When a plane went down, they mounted extensive searches, and almost always they found the plane within a day or two. Pilots all filed flight plans, a detailed plan for where and when they were going to fly with all the courses explained. They would come. They would look for him. The searchers would get government planes and cover both sides of the flight plan filed by the pilot and search until they found him. Maybe even today. They might come today. That was the second, this was the second day after the crash. No, Brian frowned. Was it the first day or the second day? They had gone down in the afternoon and he had spent the whole night out cold. So this was the first real day. But they could still come today. They would have started the search immediately when Brian's plane did not arrive. Yeah, they would probably come today. Probably come in here with amphibious planes, small bush planes with floats that could land right here on the lake and pick him up and take him home. Which home? The father home or the mother home? He stopped the thinking. It didn't matter, either on to his dad or back to his mother. Either way, he would probably be home by late night or early morning. Home, where he could sit down and eat a large, cheesy, juicy burger with tomatoes and double fries with ketchup and a thick chocolate shake. And there came hunger. Brian rubbed his stomach. The hunger had been there, but something else, fear, pain, had held it down. Has that ever happened to you? You know, a stressful, scary situation or an intense situation. You got to run, do a lot of physical exercise. Sometimes you don't process your own hunger until it's over. Now, with the thought of the burger, the emptiness roared at him. He could not believe the hunger. He had never felt it this way. The lake water had filled his stomach, but it left it hungry. And now it demanded food, screamed for food. And there was, he thought, absolutely nothing to eat. Nothing. What did they do in the movies when they got stranded like this? Oh, yes, the hero usually found some kind of plant that he knew was good to eat and took care of it. Just ate the plant until he was full or used some kind of cute trap to catch an animal and cook it over a slick little fire. And pretty soon he had, an eight, he had a full eight-course meal. The trouble, Brian thought, looking around, was that all he could see was grass and brush. There was nothing obvious to eat. And aside from about a million birds and the beaver he'd seen animal and, and the beaver, he hadn't seen animals to trap and cook. And even if he got one somehow, he didn't have any matches, so he couldn't have a fire. Nothing. They kept coming back to that. He had nothing. Well, almost nothing. As a matter of fact, he thought, I don't know what I've got or haven't got. Maybe I should try and figure out just how I stand would give me something to do, keep me from thinking of food, until they come to find me. Brian had once had an English teacher, a guy named Perpich, who was always talking about being positive, thinking positive, staying on top of things. That's how Perpich had put it. Stay positive and stay on top of things. Brian thought of him now, wondered how to stay positive and stay on top of this. All Perpich would say is that I've got to get motivated. He's always telling kids to get motivated. Brian changed position so he was sitting on his knees. He reached into his pockets and took out everything he had and laid it on the grass in front of him. It was pitiful enough. A quarter, three dimes, a nickel, and two pennies. A fingernail clipper. A billfold with a $20 bill. In case you get stranded at the airport in some small town and have to buy food, his mother had said. And some odd pieces of paper. And on his belt... Somehow, still there, the hatchet 
his mother had given him. He'd forgotten it and now reached around and took it out and put it on the grass. There was a touch of rust already forming on the cutting edge of the blade, and he rubbed it off with his thumbs. That was it. He frowned. No, wait. If he was going to play the game, he might as well play it right. Perpich would tell him to quit messing around. Get motivated. Look at all of it, Robinson. He had on a pair of good tennis shoes, now almost dry, and socks, and jeans and underwear and a thin leather belt, and a t-shirt with a windbreaker so torn it hung on him in tatters. And a watch. He had a digital watch, still on his wrist, but it was broken from the crash, the little screen blank. And he took it off and almost threw it away, but stopped the hand motion and lay the watch on the grass with the rest of it. There. That was it. No wait. One other thing. Those were all the things he had, but he also had himself. Perpich used to drum that into them. You are your most valuable asset. Don't forget that. You are the best thing you have. Brian looked around again. I wish you were here, Perpich. I'm hungry, and I'd trade everything I have for a hamburger. I'm hungry, he said it out loud, in normal tones at first, and then louder and louder until he was yelling it. I'm hungry! I'm hungry! I'm hungry! When he stopped, there was a sudden silence. Not just from him, but the clicks and burps and bird sounds of the forest as well. The noise of his voice had startled everything, and it was quiet. He looked around, listened with his mouth open, realizing that in all his life he had never heard silence before. Complete silence. There had always been some sound, some kind of sound. It lasted only a few seconds, but it was so intense that it seemed to become a part of him. Nothing. There was no sound. Then the bird started again, and some kind of buzzing insect, and then a chattering and a cawing, and soon there was the same background of sound, which left him still hungry. Of course, he thought, putting the coins and the rest back in his pocket and the hatchet in his belt, of course, if they come tonight, and, or even if they take as long as tomorrow, the hunger is no big thing. People have gone for many days without food, as long as they've got water. And even, even if they didn't come until late tomorrow, I'll be all right. Lose a little weight, maybe, but the first hamburger and a malt and fries will bring it right back. A mental picture of hamburger, the way they showed it in television commercials, thundered into his thoughts. Rich colors, the juicy meat and hot. He pushed the picture away. So even if they didn't find him until tomorrow, he thought, he would be all right. He had plenty of water, although he wasn't sure if it was good and clean or not. He sat again by the tree, his back against it. There was a thing bothering him. He wasn't sure what it was, but it kept chewing at the edge of his thoughts. Something about the plane and the pilot that would change things. Ah, there it was. The moment when the pilot had had his heart attack, his right foot had jerked down on the rudder pedal, and the plane had slewed sideways. What did that mean? Why did that keep coming into his thinking that way, nudging and pushing? Why do you folks think, huh? I think you know. It means, a voice in his thoughts said, that they might not be coming for you tonight or even tomorrow. When the pilot pushed the rudder pedal, the plane had jerked to the side and assumed a new course. Brian could not remember how much it had pulled around, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have had to be much because after that, with the pilot dead, Brian had flown for an hour, had flown for hour after hour on the new course. Well away from the flight plan the pilot had filed. Many hours, maybe at 160 miles per hour, even if it was only a little off course, with that speed and time, Brian might now be sitting several hundred miles off to the side on the recorded flight plan. And they would probably search most heavily at first along the flight plan course. They might go out to the side a little, but he could easily be three, four hundred miles to the side. He could not know. He could not think of how far he might have flown wrong because he didn't know the original course and didn't know how much they had pulled sideways. Quite a bit. That's how he remembered it. Quite a jerk to the side. It pulled his head over sharply when the plane had swung around. 
They might not find him for two or three days. He felt his heartbeat increase as the fear started. The thought was there, but he fought it down for a time, pushed it away. Then it exploded out. They might not find him for a long time. Ooh, terrifying to conclude that, right? I'm definitely on my own for a while. Nobody's coming soon. And the next thought was there as well, that they might never find him. But that was panic, and he fought it down and tried to stay positive. They searched hard when a plane went down and used many people and planes, and they would go to the side. They would know he was off from the flight path. He had talked to the man on the radio. They would somehow know. It would be all right. They would find. They would soon find him. Maybe not tomorrow, but soon? Soon. Soon. They would find him soon. Gradually, like sloshing oil, his thoughts settled back, and the panic was gone. Say they didn't come for two days. No, say they didn't come for three days. Even push that to four days. He could live with that. He would have to live with that. He didn't want to think of them taking longer. But say four days. He had to do something. He couldn't just sit at the bottom of this tree and stare down at the lake for four days. And nights. He was in deep woods and didn't have any matches. Couldn't make a fire. There were large things in the woods. There were wolves, he thought, and bears. Other things. In the dark, he would be in the open here just sitting at the bottom of a tree. He looked around suddenly, felt the hair on the back of his neck go up. Things might be looking at him right now, waiting for him, waiting for dark so they could move in and take him. He fingered the hatchet at his belt. It was the only weapon he had, but it was something. He had to have some kind of shelter. No, make that more. He had to have some kind of shelter, and he had to have something to eat. He pulled himself to his feet and jerked the back of his shirt down before the mosquitoes could get at it. He had to do something to help himself. I have to get motivated, he thought, remembering Perpich. Right now, I'm all I've got. I have to do something. So that was chapter five. We'll move on now to chapter six. We'll go for one more here. Chapter six. Two years before, he and Terry had been fooling around near the park, where the city seemed to end for a time and the trees grew thick and came down to the small river that went through the park. It was thick there and seemed kind of wild, and they'd been joking and making things up and pretended that they were lost in the woods and talked in the afternoon about what they would do. Of course, they figured they'd have all sorts of goodies like gum and a knife and fishing gear and matches so they could hunt and fish and have a fire. I wish you were here, Terry, he thought, with a gun and knife and some matches. In the park that time, they had decided the best shelter was a lean-to, and Brian set out now to make one up. Maybe cover it with grass or leaves or sticks, he thought, and he started to go down to the lake again, where there were some willows he could cut down for braces. But it struck him that he ought to find a good place for the lean-to, so he decided to look around first. He wanted to stay near the lake because he thought the plane, even deep in the water, might show up to somebody flying over, and he didn't want to diminish any chance he might have of being found. His eyes fell upon the stone ridge to his left, and he thought at first he should build his shelter against the stone. But before that, he decided to check out the far side of the ridge, and that was where he got lucky. Using the sun and the fact that it rose in the east and set in the west, he decided that the far side was the northern side of the ridge. At one time in the far past, it had been scooped by something, probably a glacier, and this scooping had left a kind of sideways bowl, large, a back in under a ledge. It wasn't very deep, not a cave, but it was smooth and made a perfect roof, and he could almost stand in under the ledge. He had to hold his head slightly tipped forward at the front to keep it from hitting the top. Some of the rock that had been scooped out had also been pulverized by the glacial action, turned into sand, and now made a small sand beach that went down to the edge of the water, in front and to the right of the overhang. It was his first good luck. No, he thought, he had good luck in the landing, but this was good luck as well. Luck he needed. 
All he had to do was wall off part of the bowl and leave an opening as a doorway, and he would have a perfect shelter, much stronger than a lean-to and dry because the overhang made a watertight roof. He crawled back in and under the ledge and sat. The sand was cool here in the shade, and the coolness felt wonderful to his face, which was already starting to blister and get especially painful on his forehead with the blisters on top of the swelling. He was also still weak. Just the walk around the back of the ridge and the slight climb over the top had left his legs rubbery. It felt good to sit for a bit under the shade of the overhang in the cool sand. And now, he thought, if I just had something to eat. Anything. When he rested a bit, he went back down to the lake and drank a couple of swallows of water. He wasn't all that thirsty, but he thought the water might help to take the edge off of his hunger. It didn't. Somehow, the cold lake water actually made it worse, sharpened it. He thought of dragging in wood to make a wall on part of the overhang and picked up one piece to pull up, but his arms were too weak, and he knew then that it wasn't just the crash and injury to his body and head, it was also that he was weak from hunger. He would have to find something to eat. Before he did anything else, he would have to have something to eat. But what? Brian leaned against the rock and stared out at the lake. What in all of this was there to eat? He was so used to having food just be there. Just always being there, right? And that's what, another reason why I love the story is it reminds us of so many things we take for granted. Things we took for granted even growing up. Or if you're a kid yourself. When he was hungry, he went to the icebox or to the store or sat down to a meal his mother cooked. Oh, he thought, remembering a meal now. Oh, it was the last Thanksgiving last year, the last Thanksgiving they had as a family before his mother demanded the divorce and his father moved out in the following January. Brian already knew the secret, but did not know it would cause them to break up and thought it might work out. The secret that his father still did not know but that he would try to tell him when he saw him. The meal had been turkey, and they cooked it in the backyard in the barbecue over charcoal with the lid down tight. His father had put hickory chips on the charcoal, and the smell of the cooking turkey and the hickory smoke had filled the yard. When his father took the lid off, smiling, the smell that had come out was unbelievable. And when they sat to eat the meat, and when they sat to eat, the meat was wet with juice and rich, had the taste of smoke in it. He had to stop this. His mouth was full of saliva, and his stomach was twisting and growling. What was there to eat? What had he read or seen that told him about food in the wilderness? Hadn't there been something? A show, yes, a show on television about Air Force pilots and some kind of course they took? A survival course. All right. He had the show coming into his thoughts now. The pilots had to live in the desert, they put them in the desert down in Arizona or someplace, and they had to live for a week. They had to find food and water for a week. For water, they made a sheet of plastic into a dew-gathering device, and for food, they ate lizards. That was it. Of course, Brian had lots of water, and there weren't too many lizards in the Canadian woods. That he knew. One of the pilots had used a watch crystal as a magnifying glass to focus the sun and start a fire so they didn't have to eat the lizards raw. But Brian had a digital watch, without a crystal, broken at that, so the show didn't help him that much. Wait, there was one thing. One of the pilots, a woman, had found some kind of beans on a bush, and she had used them with her lizard meat to make a little stew in a tin can she had found. Bean lizard stew. There weren't any beans here, but there must, there must be berries. There had to be berry bushes around. That's what everybody always said. Well, he actually never heard anybody say it, but he felt that it should be true. There must be berry bushes. He stood and moved out into the sand and looked up at the sun. It was still high. He didn't know what time it must be. At home, it would be one or two if the sun were, this, were that high. At home, at one or two, his mother would be putting away the lunch dishes and getting ready for her exercise class. No, that would have been yesterday. Today, she would be going to see him. Today was Thursday, and she always went to see him on Thursdays. Wednesday was the exercise class, and Thursdays she went to see him. Hot little jets of hate worked into his thoughts, pushed once, moved back. If his mother hadn't begun to see him and forced the divorce, 
Brian wouldn't be here now. Now, do we know that to be true? No, but that's what's in the boy's head. He shook his head. He had to stop that kind of thinking. The sun was still high, and that meant that he had some time before darkness to find berries. He didn't want to be away from th- from his, he almost thought of it as home, shelter when it came to be dark. He didn't want to be anywhere in the woods when it came to be dark. Excuse me. He didn't want to get lost, which was a real problem. All he knew in the world was the lake in front of him and the hill th- at the hill at his back and the ridge. If he lost sight of them, there was a really good chance that he could get turned around and not find his way back. So he had to look for berry bushes, but keep the lake or the rock ridge in sight at all times. Imagine just trying to form this plan, right? Like, what's a reasonable thing to do in this situation I have never saw coming? He looked up at the lake shore to the north. For a good distance, perhaps 200 yards, it was fairly clear. There were tall pines, the kinds with no limbs, until very close to the top, with a gentle breeze sighing in them, but not too much low brush. 200 yards up there seemed to be a belt of thick lower brush starting, about 10 or 12 feet high, and that formed a wall he could not see through. It seemed to go on, around the lake, thick and lushy green, but he could not be sure. If there were berries, they would be in that bush, he felt, and as long as he stayed close to the lake so he, couldn't, so he could keep the water on his right and know it was there, he wouldn't get lost. When he was done or found berries, he thought he would just turn around so the water was on his left and walk back until he came to the ridge in his shelter. Simple. Keep it simple. I am Brian Robeson. I have been in a plane crash. I am going to find some food. I am going to find some berries. He walked slowly, still a bit pained in his joints and weak from hunger, up along the side of the lake. The trees were full of birds singing ahead of him in the sun. Some he knew, some he didn't. He saw a robin and some kind of sparrows, and the flock, and a flock of reddish-orange birds with thick beaks. Any idea what those are? Twenty or thirty of them were sitting in one of the pines. They made much noise and flew away ahead of him when he walked under the tree. He watched them fly, their color a bright slash in solid green, and in this way he found the berries. The birds landed in some taller willow type of undergrowth with wide leaves and started jumping and making noise. At first he was too far away to see what they were doing, but their color drew him and he moved toward them, keeping the lake in sight on his right, and when he got closer he saw they were eating berries. He could not believe it was that easy. It was as if the birds had taken him right to the berries. The slender branches went up about twenty feet and were heavy, dropping with clusters of bright red berries. They were half as big as grapes, but hung in bunches much like grapes, and when Brian saw them glistening in the red sunlight, he almost yelled. His pace quickened and he was in them in moments, scattering the birds, grabbing branches, stripping them to fill his mouth with berries. He almost spit them out. It wasn't as if they were bitter, as much as they lacked any sweetness, had a tart flavor, and left his mouth dry feeling. And they were like cherries in that they had large pits, which made them hard to chew. But there was such a hunger in him, such an emptiness, that he could not stop, and kept stripping branches and eating berries by the handful, grabbing and jamming them into his mouth, and swallowing them, pits and all. He could not stop, and when at last his stomach was full, he was still hungry. Two days without food must have shrunk in his stomach, but the drive of hunger was still there. Thinking of the birds and how they would come back into the berries when he left, he made a carrying pouch of his torn windbreaker and kept picking. Finally, when he judged he had close to four pounds in the jacket, he stopped and went back to his camp by the, frid- by the ridge. Now, he thought, now I have some food and I can do something about fixing this place up. He glanced at the sun and saw that he had some time before dark. If I only had matches, he thought, looking ruefully at the beach and lakeside. There was driftwood everywhere, not to mention dead or dry wood all over the hill and some dead dry branches hanging from every tree. All firewood. And no matches. How did they used to do it, he thought? Rub two sticks together? He tucked the berries in the pouch back in under the overhang in the cool shade and found a couple of sticks. After ten minutes of rubbing, he felt the sticks, and they were almost cool to the touch. Not that, he thought. They didn't do fire that way. He threw the sticks down in disgust. So, no fire. 
but he could still fix the shelter and make it, here the word safer came into his mind that he didn't know why, more livable. Kind of, uh, kind of close in, uh, kind of close it in, he thought. I'll close it in a bit. He started dragging sticks up from the lake and pulling long dead branches down from the hill, never getting out of sight of the water and the ridge. With these, he interlaced and wove a wall across the opening of the front of the rock. It took over two hours, and he had to stop several times because he still felt a bit weak, and once because he had felt a strange new twinge in his stomach. A tightening. Rolling. Too many berries, he thought. I ate too many of them. But it was gone soon, and he kept working until the entire front of the overhang was covered save for a small opening at the right end nearest the lake. The doorway was about three feet, and when he went in, he found himself in a room almost fifteen feet long and eight to ten feet deep, with the rock wall sloping down at the rear. Good, he said, nodding. Good. Outside, the sun was going down, finally, and in the initial coolness, the mosquitoes came out again and clouded in on him. They were thick, terrible, if not quite as bad as in the morning, and he kept brushing them off his arms until he couldn't stand it, then dumped the berries and pulled the torn windbreaker on. At least the sleeves covered his arms. Wrapped in the jacket, with darkness coming down fast now, he crawled back in under the rock and huddled, tried to sleep. He was deeply tired and still aching some, but sleep was slow coming and did not finally settle in until the evening cool turned into night cool and the mosquitoes slowed. Then at last, with his stomach turning on the berries, Brian went to sleep. That was chapter six. We will pick up at chapter seven uh, when I upload the next video. So please like the video, subscribe, share with your friends if you like, and we'll keep the chapters coming every week. Thanks again so much for reading with me.